I want to share with you all, this is um, about a year ago. I'm sorry, I might be emotional, but this is, this is a good story. This is a praise. Um, I lost my father and it was very unexpected and it was very traumatic. And the day I lost my dad, the Lord said to me so clearly, um, I, I remember this moment where he showed me all of these things that he was going to do in the wake of my father's death. And he said to me, he showed me all of this and he said, you're up here on the mountain with me and I'm going to show you everything that I am going to do, but you can't stay up here. You've got to go down to the valley because there are things for you to see and hear and say and do while you're down there. And you won't be able to see me, but I promise I am so close and I am never leaving you. And I will bring you back up to this mountain so that you can see, so you can get glimpses and it can give you hope as you go back down into that valley. And this past year, there have been so many moments where I have I have been in, in the darkness of that valley and I have been confused and I have been scared and I have been wondering, where are you, Lord? Where are you? And I've been struggling to find him and see him. And he'd bring me up to this mountaintop where he would show me again. Remember, I said I wasn't going to leave you there. You've got to hold to this. You've got to hold fast. You've got to have hope. And somewhere along the way in my Christian upbringing, I, I had this definition of hope as well, you have this really strong feeling where you're like, man, I hope this happens, I hope it happens. And if it doesn't happen right away, well, it wasn't God's plan. So let me figure out how to keep walking and, and, and create this new understanding of, well, God is good, even though that really good thing I hoped for that's biblical didn't come, didn't come to pass. And, and what I've been learning this year in the valley, in these times of growth that hurt and that are hard, is that hope is nothing like what I thought it was. Hope is something to contend for, to work for, to fight for, and to not let go of. And I had a moment I shared with you all in a Bible study back in the spring when I was at the very beginning of this journey, and it's silly now, but it was so true. I One day I planted grass in my front yard, and it took so much work. I, I, got the little roller thing and I, I wanted this beautiful lush grass and I threw all this grass seed and like the next day it didn't look any different and I was irritated I was literally irritated like I put all this work but even though I knew that it wasn't gonna look different I had that and the Lord told me like we, we have to change your expectation of growth and hope and all of that and that's what this year has been and all of these promises right off the bat I saw some promises being fulfilled and it was this mountaintop experience where I would look and say, that's right, God, you did tell me you were gonna do that. And I'm continuing to see those this past year. And one of the biggest ones that is just a massive praise has been, the Lord has been telling me that he is after my brother. He is after my brother's heart and he is not going to leave my brother fatherless. And. And it got really bad for my brother for a while. Really, really, really bad. And just these last couple weeks, God, I can see the hand of God just ripping things out of his life that were going to kill him. Um, and my brother is now in this place where he is open and the spirit of the Lord is moving through him and he's still in his own process. But but I see God pursuing him. So, so the, the praise and what I want to share with you all is that... This last year has been a year of being down in the valley, of really, really having to lean in to what does it look like when you're in a really difficult time and you're leaning into growth. And I'm learning that hope is so much more than, oh, I hope this happens. Darn it, it didn't happen. So let me just try and figure out how to hope for something else. I'm learning that hope is something that does not disappoint, that you can throw your weight into, you can throw your energy into it, and the Lord honors that. It's almost like this little investment thing, like every day I put these little investments in hope, and it comes to fruition, it comes in, and I'm still in this place where I'm learning what that looks like. I still throw seeds, and the next day when they don't grow, I'm, I'm frustrated, but I'm learning that there's so much more, because if we... If we, if God did operate
operate in such a way where every time we threw seeds, the grass came up, the second it got enough sun, it would scorch it. So God is working and growing these roots in me that I don't like because I can't see it and it takes a lot, but now I'm seeing this grass and these plants come up and they're not being scorched by the sun. They're not falling away. They're, they're roots taking place. So I am, I am encouraged. Um, it has not been easy. And there have been so many moments where I find myself faltering in this valley saying like, Lord, where are you? Where are you? I feel like a child throwing a fit because they don't know what's happening. And in his kindness and in his grace, he continues to calm my spirit and give me this teeny glimpse and remind me of what it is that he has done and to continue to hope for that which he has said, but has not yet been done. So I give God all of the glory and the praise. Um, in my moments of just complete um, lack of faith, that he would hear me come to him and say, I believe, but help me believe. I believe, but help me believe more. He has said yes, and he has helped me with that. So, so hope is so much more, guys, kids. I wanna to speak to you, look at me. I'm learning what hope is, grow in hope. Know what hope is and don't let it, don't let the enemy tell us that, well, you hoped for it for two days, for a week, for a year, so it didn't happen. So probably not gonna happen, that's a lie. Hope is something that we get to throw all of our weight into and watch God continue to grow us in that. Amen. Amen. Paul said hope does not disappoint. All right, who else? All right. Miss Rachel to the plate. Now she woke up. You want to stand up or sit down? I didn't share this last week, but maybe it's because I was supposed to this week. Um, and there was a little bit of, to be honest, maybe shame around it. Um, that I process a little bit with Matt. So anyway, me and I have been on lots of journeys the past couple years. And one of them has been, um, we are driving older vehicles. We um, decided that we didn't want to have any car debt. Um, which was really hard for both of us in the beginning because we like to drive nice cars. <laughs> We've always had a pretty nice car. Um, so dying to car pride, that's what we've called it. Just really dying to that and um, enjoying not having a monthly payment and um, loving our vehicles, not worrying what other people think. Just all these things um, have been happening and really like being in that place like man i'm like maybe i'll never have a new car because why would i ever want to put money in that like we'll put our money somewhere else you know like just all these things happening and as most of you know my grandmother passed um a couple months ago now um and my mom called us one day and was like um can you give me 25 dollars a month and i was like uh, okay <laughs> for the phone or for what? And she was like, you're gonna get Nanny's car. And I was like, what? And this car, it's it's a 2020 Accord. It had 6,800 miles on it. Um, pretty much, new. yeah, brand new, souped up, really nice car. Little thing in the front. <laughs> oh, <laughs> old Nanny. <laughs> and um, I was like, what? Yes. And, but part of the testimony is Rachel before would have really like needed that in a sense, like getting to go back to a brand new car would have really felt like relieving, like, oh, thank God, like I don't have to drive this old car any longer. And I was so grateful, but there wasn't this dependency that I needed that. It was like, whoa. This was completely unexpected. I was okay without this. And, um, which was really beautiful. It was like, you know, the moments when you realize the work in your heart actually happened, you know, like that was one of those yeah. moments for me. And um, so then I'm like, you know, I'm still a driving fan. We're like, wow, Nanny's gonna drive a new car. This is amazing. But then, you know, I started just praying about it. I'm like, honestly, I think we have some options. 
And, um, but I want to honor my family. I didn't want to take this thing, go and, you know, sell it, whatever. There was just a lot of factors. And this is the testimony too of seeking counsel. Um, we are very blessed to have Matt and Kirsten at Sage degrees. <laughs> um, I think I've always been a person that wants to seek counsel, but this has been the most healthiest dynamic I've ever experienced in my life. And Manny and I really, for almost everything, we really want them to weigh in. And it's not in this weird, unbalanced way. It's because we always know they help us see our blind spots and always are pointing us back to the Lord. And um, so Matt had suggested something I hadn't even thought about. It was like, oh, well, maybe you can sell your van, trade in the new car and get a newer van, which again, the car find was so dead to me. I didn't even, I wasn't thinking I want an upgrade, you know? And so there's still a lot of moving parts, but um, CarMax, we went yesterday, Katie came with me and um, they offered way more than I thought they were going to, which never happens at CarMax. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so probably on the horizon, looks like a newer be newer van for the last race. Yes. And um, I'm just, I'm grateful. Yeah. I don't know if I got to explain everything, but that's, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I would say even to add to the testimony or uh, testify of how much her car pride died, the van that she speaks of now broke down on the way to get the new car and it still didn't cross her mind that I should get rid of this yeah. van. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool that you added that. That was probably the most powerful testimony. Yeah. Like I'm really glad Matt added that because I was gonna I was gonna actually add that too. Like that probably out of that whole journey was the most powerful thing for me to witness because Rachel I mean, Rachel, I don't know how many years, months or years ago, if that had happened, it would have manifested in a very different way. And just, just have the confidence and the peace of the Lord that she had, that like, it was like, because that's kind of every mom with a minivan is like, I'm not saying their worst nightmare, but like being on the side of a highway with your two kids and a broke down van. And like, she went through it, and I know she had Katie there too, but like, that I thought was the greatest testimony of the inner workings of the Lord and the fruit of that. She still had peace in the midst of all that. Yeah. 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 All right. Who else? I know we have a bunch more. Yeah. I'm not going to bite you. Come on up there. You just jump. I'm going to say it just because I'm a little weak. Um, most everybody knows my story about last year about just coming back to the Lord, but it past year has been extremely trying for me just because of re having to relearn everything that I grew up with and Matt had told me at one point he's like the easiest thing to do is just try to keep your mouth shut he's like if you need to step back and just keep your mouth shut he's like people are going to learn and I started doing that and unfortunately had to change jobs because of how hard things had gotten in trying to control my tongue that ended up switching jobs within the company I work at and it's progressively getting better but especially during the fast things are coming out of the woodwork that I've never even seen within myself and Thankfully, it's it's made me much more open to talking about fruit. And thankfully, like I've got multiple coworkers at their churches are all doing similar fasts. So they're like, oh man, we're going to encourage you. We're going to help you with it. We're going to stand by you in this and, and not worry about what you're doing. And they're like, we're just going to take it easy on you. And we're going to make sure that everything works according to plan. And it's it's been really good because it's opened up a lot more talk regarding faith, doctrine, theology, things like that, which has been really, really neat for me because it's one of my passions. And just this week alone, my 
my boss's dad died and I had not even known it. He had had a stroke while he was gone. And I was just talking to him about just the Lord comforting us. And I had uh, said the scripture just kind of cornally. I was like, precious in the Lord is the, the precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I didn't know that his dad had died because we were just talking about scriptures and different ones that have stuck to us through the years. And he's like, man, are you prophetic? And I'm like, no. I was like, I'm just trying to be sensitive and just talking about what I normally like. And little things like that, that the Lord's been working out in me has just been amazing. And yeah, I've made mistakes and not eating the right food and done some stupid things, falling off a scissor lift and just making mistakes left and right. But yet the Lord teaching me grace just to keep carrying on and patience through everything that I've ended up getting more and more and more workloaded on me, not in a bad way, but in a good way and more responsibility. And it's just the Lord teaching me. It's, it's good. Mm. Work. <laughs> recently the Lord has been teaching me what it means to just wait upon him um, you know I think most of you guys know I'm kind of in the process of starting my own business um, doing just media and marketing and um, one of the things that has stuck with me for like two years now was um, person had said you know just going into new things just pressing into the Lord those things so that when things get hard, you're confident in the decision that you made. And so starting this business, I wanted to make sure that I was confident in what I, in what I was doing, and I have been. Um, and the most recent direction that the Lord has given me in all of it was to, that there was going to be a shift at my job and then a transition. And that was it. That was literally all he said. And there was a big shift, um, a big shift at work. But I found myself trying to read into, you know, okay, what does that mean? What is the transition? Like, I'm going to try to figure it out. And the Lord's just like, wait upon me. Wait upon me. You don't have to try to figure it out. That's not the point for you to, like, you know, come talk to me about it and then go there just by yourself with just Tori and, um, so yeah, just waiting upon the Lord and, and the direction that he gives you and the promises that he's promising and, and trusting that the vision that he's giving you is all you need in that moment. And you don't have to try to solve a puzzle with him. Yeah. Um, just kind of like what Matt says, like he's not weird. <laughs> he's not weird and he's not trying to confuse us. He's yeah. just giving you what you need in that moment yeah. to push forward and have faith in those yeah. things. Amen. That's it. Amen. All right, who else? Miss Shannon. As y'all know, I am, okay, let's do this no matter what. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Hurry, hurry, go, 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 go. The last two, three months, I have been leaning into the word rest. Leaning into the word of he is our rest, he is our refuge, he is our rock. And that is hard for someone like me. Uh, you know yourself. I don't like to do that. <laughs> I I could be 
feeling like the worst ever and I'm still gonna go. But he put it on my heart to lean into rest. And it has been the best thing. It has been healing, not just physically, but emotionally, um, making connections with people, which is very hard for me to do. And just understanding that rest can be peaceful, not just physically, emotionally, but spiritually. Um, in my rest, I have been listening to a lot of Christian music, doing the women's Bible study by reading to me, and just grasping on to his power, grasping on to him and just being like, okay, Lord, if this is what you want, I'm not fighting anymore. It's not worth the frustration. I'm going to lean in to your rest. And it was hard at first, but now I can see the fruit of the resting and can see where it's, it's not bad anymore. It's something powerful. It's something that we all need at times, and I'm glad he hit me upside the head until I listened. Amen. 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 Yeah. So, if you got something, come on up. And, and also, guys, like, it can be small things. It can be un things that aren't done yet. It can be just little. It doesn't matter. It's everything in between. You've already done a big one, you lost your chance, but no. Okay. Oh man, it's weird because I know what's on the other side of the phone, <laughs> which is my big head. You know, You're looking good. <laughs> so, I really resonated with what Shannon just said. Um, so, Last year I started my own business as well, and I also was working for uh, Gary, which is Matt's neighbor, and I was doing all this stuff, and of course during the week I'm like messaging Matt, asking him questions, like what do I do about this, what do I do about this? And then on the weekends, Matt would see me at his neighbor's house working, and one day he just pops his head in and he's like, you take any breaks? And I was like, no man, we're doing all this stuff all the time. And he was like, you know, you can work a lot better in five days if you rest for a day. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's pretty crummy advice, Matt. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> thought you were tough, Matt. Um, and then going into this year, I decided like, that's probably a really good idea. And so, um, sort of on purpose and sort of on accident, just started trying to um, make my weeks, because I kept saying, like, oh, I'm going to schedule all this stuff, and then I just kept not doing it. And then uh, going into this year, um, we just wasn't getting as many calls for things, and I was like, you know, this is probably God saying, like, if you won't slow yourself down, I will slow you down. And I was like, eh, that's probably a pretty good idea, God. And um, it... A lot of things came together all at once. Um, one thing was I had a particularly slow week and that weekend my dad called and he said, hey, your grandfather passed away. And I'm doing a funeral and it's in Louisiana. Can you go with me? I was like, I didn't even think about it. I was like, of course, of course I'm gonna go with you. Which is something that if I had had all this work scheduled out would have been an absolute pain, like a logistical nightmare to try to push everything around to try to figure it out. I got really close to the mic all of a sudden. And it was just really, it was, I mean, he was 95 years old. He lived an amazing life. And it was just really cool to be able to go and provide support for my father, but also to celebrate the life of my grandfather. And I have to worry about work. It was really, really nice to not have to like email a thousand people 
and say like, hey, I can't be there because I don't really like people knowing my business anyway. And they're like, oh, why are you doing So it was really, really <laughs> nice to just be able to not have to worry about any of that and spend the week with family in a time when um, when they needed us. So anyway, um, Shannon, I thank you for sharing that because I might not have said anything if <laughs> you hadn't said that. Amen. Jared. Jared's the hardworking man. Come on. Laura, you want to slow? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So I hear a lot of you guys all the time talk about how you hear the Lord talking to you and tell you to do this, to do that. And my wife tells me every day when she gets into the Bible, so the Lord tells me to go to this and to read this and this. And I don't really hear that, you know, like she does. And a lot of times I'm like, why am I not hearing this? Or maybe it's just that I'm not listening, oh boy, correctly. <laughs> Until about a week and a half ago, um, Clearly, I heard the Lord talking to me. So, you know, about three months ago, my wife had these respiratory illnesses. It really knocked her out for weeks. And about a week ago or so, she started to catch something else and was, you know, feeling awful and staying up at night. And so one day I came in there and uh, she was lying on the bed and clearly heard the Lord tell me, pray over your wife. And... I'm not the best at praying. I do what I can and every day at the meal, you know, we'll say the same, I mean, kind of prayer and I sort of stumble through and that's it, you know. But that day, I put my hand on her and I started praying and I'm not sure what I said, but it was perfect. Yeah. And it's like, I mean, it was I don't think that I was speaking, but everything I said just flowed and when I was finished, it's, I don't know, it felt like a miracle. <laughs> and about a day and a half later, she sends me a message while I'm at work. And she said, I feel perfect. I like, you know, it's like, like nothing ever happened. Wow. So, uh, you know, kind, of, kind of big for me. <laughs> Mark talking in public speaking. <laughs> See, I want to do the third testimony on rest. When Matt sent the message yesterday, I said, I know God's working in my life, and I'm going to give a testimony. I didn't know what, but this morning I um, decided that it was rest. So it's funny that Shannon's talked about rest and Jared's talked about rest. But also he just reminded me, the Lord just reminded me, um, within the last three or four months, um, there was a, sh a song shared, and it was, um, He Restores Everything. And I remember just listening to it and just being just over and over again thinking he will restore everything and just believing it. And I just want to testify this morning that um, he's restoring so many things in my life. But the one I want to testify to this morning is rest at night. I was, um, you know, going to sleep or going to bed at night and, you know, I'd wake up and I'd look at that. I dread looking at the clock because I'd be like, oh, one o'clock. And I knew from, you know, pretty much from there on, he was just going to be watching the clock. And in the last two or three months, um, two or three weeks, which has been in this month, I realized when um, Matt says, what has the Lord been doing this month in your life? I've been laying down and I've been going to sleep and I'll wake up and I'll like, look at the clock and it's like 5 a.m. and I'm like, praise you, Lord, praise you, Lord. So I just want to give him the glory today that all the things he is restoring in my life and there'll be time to testify to more of those. Yeah. This morning, I just want to testify to the fact that he's restoring my nighttime rest. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, uh, I was, I was just thinking about this. The Lord kind of reminded me um, to start, but uh, probably a few months ago, I really, um, I, had, I had a morning with the Lord, and um, it was just peaceful, and it, it was awesome, and um, I had to go somewhere and run an errand. And as I'm doing that, um, I was reminded of the scripture that, that Jesus talks about when he says, when he talks about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field, 
um, and, and how they neither toil nor reap or they, they don't do anything yet, yet God still takes care of them. And um, I really felt strongly that the Lord was saying like, Ryan, it's okay. You don't know what tomorrow looks like. You don't know what the future looks like, but I got it. You know, I'm going to take care of you. And it wasn't just like this little symbol like, oh, I'm going to take care of you. And No, it, it, it like, it rested on me. And, and in the times where it, I'm, I'm looking at things, I'm going, God, I have no idea um, how this is going to work out. And every single moment, without a shadow of a doubt, like Tori and I have been talking and we're like, I don't know how this is going to go, but we're just going to, you know, stay faithful to what we're doing. And, uh, and time and time again, God has just shown up, shown up in and, and, and just big ways. And, and it's, I mean, yeah, it's, it's just awesome. Like, you know, she's looked at me and just been like, how is this going to happen? I was like, mm -hmm. and then, you know, she would get a website or it was something like that. And there was, we were always, there was never a moment where we were without. Yeah. And it was just, you know, I would, I would sit back and, and, and I'd text her. She'd text me and she's like, well, you remember God told us that he was going to take care of us. And then that was just the, the sum, that was something that we could rest on, we could, we could prop on, we could sit on and be like, you know what, God? No, I don't have to worry about anything. Because you do have us. So. Amen. Amen. Come on up, man. Oh, they're fighting over it now. Go ahead. Here we go. My heart was doing the weird thing. I, I understand completely. So one of mine, of course, goes with Russ too. So since last year, since I've been staying home, like whenever Lily was napping or like I had quiet time, I felt like I had to be, like I had to be cleaning, I had to be getting dinner ready, I had to be doing, like I always had to be doing something. If I didn't, like I felt like I was being lazy. And a few months ago, at first time pregnant, she's like, it's okay if you lay down take a nap. Like you need to learn to rest. You need to like take naps throughout your day. And I still didn't do that. So this year, I have focused more on when she's napping or like when she's being quiet for a little while and calm, which doesn't happen a lot, but like when she's mellow, I sit down, I take a nap. Or like, I just sit in the quiet. And the Lord's talking to me, he's like, and it's okay to lay down and just rest. It's okay to take a day and go hang out with other moms and their kids and you don't get the housework done and you don't get dinner done. Like, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Everything's going to keep moving and going, no matter what you get done and what you don't get done. So there was that one. And then I think the biggest thing so far this year, I was doing the social media fasting. And the Lord didn't speak to me about that. Um, and I might that, but how I view death of the others around me. It's like when my dad passed away a few years ago. Like, I thought I was doing great. And I wasn't. Like, I remember Matt said something to me one day when we were at the river. And I went home. And I was like, George, I was like, how dare he say that to me? Like, let me <laughs> just sulk and just let me be sad for a little bit. But I thought I was doing great because everybody else was not. Um, but I wasn't. <laughs> and so this year, the Lord didn't speak to me so far about, like, how I viewed up. I was raised that... When somebody dies, like, if you don't think about them every day, if you don't mourn them every day, like, you're wrong. Like, you're supposed to constantly think about them. You're supposed to always just kind of carry that sadness a little bit, you know? But he spoke to me, like, it's this beautiful thing. It's not sad. Like, it's, it's beautiful. Like, you think about where they go when they die, not about how much you're going to miss them or what you've missed out with. Or you think about where they're at. And like, and it was silly, but it wasn't just with the people, it was like with animals that we have, which to me was very silly. But last night, our dog, who, I mean, I've had this dog 13 years, which is longer than I've had a child. So it's like a very long time. He's very old, he's blind. Like he limps around, you know. He lives his life. He lives his life. <laughs> he just kind of hangs out. He's just kind of there at this point. Well, last night we were doing s'mores, and I let him out, and George was like, you know it's dark. I'm like, yes. He said the dog is blind. I'm like, yeah, he's not going to 
go anywhere. He can't get far. The dog ran away. So, <laughs> me, we're freaking out. I get the girls in the house, and George, and I'm like, we're going through the woods. Like, he could not have gone far. Like, there's no way he could have gotten very far. And we looked for probably about an hour, and George, like, make a post on Facebook. Well, we've been doing, I've been doing, you know, the social media fasting. Well, I put a post on Facebook, and within, like, five minutes, this lady I grew up with, she messaged me. And she's like, hey, here he is. Like, somebody found him. Somebody else had posted him on Facebook. And he had gone, like, all the way down the road. Like, he was gone. He had been in the road, but he was fine. And so I called George. He stopped looking. I'm like, we know where he's at. Like, you gotta go get him. When George comes home, he's like, this dog was out living his best life. He was in a brand new porch with four beautiful women. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he was living his best life. Like, he didn't want to come up. He wanted to go, you know, with people. But it reminded me, too, like, I was very sad when we didn't find him because me personally i was not prepared for that and then the lord's face he's like like this these are the things that i'm healing in you because of where he's gonna go I mean, he's lived a pretty good life for the most part you know so but yeah I mean, we've got lots of jobs, but we don't have things to do the jobs with, and just it's been really slow. So, um, and with getting ready for the new year, Mark said, "Don't invoice anything for the rest of the at in December. Don't uh, invoice anything." And I'm the money person, and usually, I start freaking out when we don't have any money. <laughs> But this year, God has given me peace and joy, and I, I have, like, I haven't said anything to Mark. You know, I'm like, okay, we'll have money for payroll. We'll be here. If not, it won't be here, and we'll do what we'll, the Lord will have something. So one thing I wanted to say to Bree, like, with hope, what we hope for sometimes is not what his ideal is for us and his is always so much better for mm -hmm. us yeah. even though it doesn't look like what we wanted it turns out to be so much more than we wanted so I mean I have been hoping for work and we've been praying for it and then this last week um, I had payroll and we had just enough to do payroll and so I was just and since I had finished everything in December and we, I mean, I hadn't had nothing to do. Like, I was trying to figure out how to get stains off my desk. That's how busy I was. <laughs> but it's usually I have audits and uh, in January, and I just always, like, get grumpy. And, and they have I've done them, like, within one day of doing it. And so it's been, God has really given me peace. And, and then, like, Friday, Thursday, we get extra jobs. We got paid another one that money was supposed to come in for 30 days. And so he has just been doing what he does, just like, you know, just let me handle it, just pray and just don't even worry about it. And I ha I, ha I really haven't. You, you, Mark would testify that I usually start freaking out, but I <laughs> <laughs> So I just give him glory and I thank him and I thank, you, thank him for more work so that now we can um, work instead of cleaning dust, so. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, did you want to add anything to that? Um, that's Gotta get up there. there yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Well. So my biggest fear, growing up and most of my adult life, has been that I can't survive. That I can't. I can't make a living that uh, I can't be, you know, I'm not responsible enough to provide. And I'm not really sure that, where that came from. Um, I was extremely insecure as a, when I was young. And um, real quick, so in the year 2000, we went bankrupt, which was my biggest fear. I figured we went bankrupt, we'd be living in a box on the side of the road. But that wasn't true. God brought my biggest, 
my biggest fear right to my face said, okay, here it is. What are you going to do? And that's where that experience is what um, transformed me into understanding God, knowing who he is, and trusting him. Um, but there's always that thing that hangs out there that, that isn't real in your life anymore, but it used to be. And it, 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 it kind of pokes at you every now and then and say, are you really, have you really turned that over? So like Suzanne was saying, um, there's two parts to our business. Um, one of them being this big industrial piece of equipment that we build and sell. I've got a guy hire who's very expensive that all he is supposed to do is sell this piece of equipment. We had a lot of momentum going into the pandemic for sales and it all stopped. And we haven't sold a filter unit for two and a half years. This guy is very expensive. And I was getting to the point where I was like, I don't know if I can really afford this guy anymore. And this guy has become a very, very, very good friend of mine. He's a, he loves the Lord. And about six, eight months ago, I felt strongly the Lord saying, I want you to start praying with this guy every morning. So I said, Scott, I think the Lord's telling me you and I need to start praying in the morning when we get to work. He got all excited. I, it wasn't the reaction I thought. I thought it was going to be like, well, okay, well, you know, we'll have to, if we have to do that, we'll do that. But he got all excited. So we started praying every, we got together every morning. And it ended up being like a two hour talk set. It got ridiculous. We got to where we weren't working and we were just talking and praying all morning. But it didn't seem like that was wrong. So we kept on doing it. And, uh, he, he's gotten, there's a lot of things with him that has seemed to gotten worked out during this period. With me, the, um, the problems with no work in that part of our business was starting to drag down our cash flow. This is what Suzanne's talking about. We had a lot of work on the other side, but because of the timing of it, it messes up the cash flow. And we were ending up with no cash. And normally I get very apprehensive. I've got 15 people working for me. I've, they, you know, they work for me forever. It's, they're like family and I feel very responsible for them. And so when we start running out of cash and, and, and we're scrapping to make payroll, it, it gets, for me, it gets very, very heavy. So here we go again, you know, because of the not selling any of these filters, uh, the timing of the other jobs, we ended up at, you know, the reserve we had all built up was gone. We were running into hand to mouth. Can we get paid this week so we can make paywall? And those were things that happened in the early days that I never wanted to revisit. And here I am again. So. God started reminding me that, look, I want to get this out of you once and for all. Yeah. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to go down this road. I just, I knew it. We were going down this road. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go down this again. <laughs> but here we are. But this time, I had to make a choice. I either had to, I either had to trust him or the same old thing was going to happen to me. And I wasn't going to get there. So, and it was like every day I had to make a conscious choice. Every day in the morning, just praying with Scott. We were, I was praying for cash flow. We were praying for a log jam of none of this work coming to break and come. And so, I'm like everybody else here. the grass seed. I prayed yesterday, Lord, why isn't it happening today? And that's another thing he was working on me on. And I realized 
This is a long trail. I've got to settle in and do what Paul said. Just be content where I find myself in this, even though it's not where I want to be. And so we get to, this is going on now for eight months. And I'm, I'm really, I'm actually starting to get tired and I'm getting a little weary and I'm like, but I know that I'm not supposed to give in to it. I'm not supposed to. My hope is to, is to stay alive. And that's what happened to me. I, the hope that, like Bree was talking about, really came alive. The trust I had in God 100% kicked in. And I just held steady. And like Suzanne said, you know, when we get in a situation, especially in January, she starts to really get grumpy, and that's a good word. And no, don't believe um, that. <laughs> that I wasn't getting that way, she wasn't getting that way. And so I think uh, Becky said last week, she talked about the reset that happened in her because of the, the fasting. So when the fast came on, when Matt called the fast, Ironically, the Lord had been telling me to fast before this, and I didn't want to do it, so I didn't do it. <laughs> so when he called for this fast, I'm like, dang on it, because I don't like doing that. And I knew that I knew that was correct. And so um, I fasted for several days, completely fast, and then I switched to the end of which I'm still doing. But this month, um, We've had an explosion of, and, I, and that's, that sounds like a, hard, a big word, but it is, an explosion of new work. We're getting uh, Kubota tractors is interested in our felt that they're going to order two of them, they're going to order four more in, in two months. That's a ton of business. Um, our cash flow is starting to improve greatly. We're getting inquiries from the other side that we haven't had before. Um, it... Uh, it's just, it's, I don't know how to explain it other than there's just been a huge breakthrough and it's, it, it's, it's like the long suffering, the hanging in there and you get to the, we get into where I was getting weary and God calls a fast of all things, which just kills me physically. I'm like, golly, I mean, I'm trying to get stuff going down there. Now I'm not going to have any energy. But there's something about, there's something about fasting. And, and, and I started noticing when I was reading, Jesus always said, he says a lot of times, when you pray and fast. And anyway, it's it's been really good. It's, it, it's I'm calling it the big reset. It um, it's it's very humbling, and um, I wasn't going to talk about this day, but here I am. Yeah, so here we are. It's been good. If he had enough energy to cut down two trees yesterday. <laughs> I think. Uh, just a, there was a, a magic moment and I wanted to share it just because it's how God works and it's easy to miss these moments. But at the beginning of all this, um, this is the part Mark didn't share, but it's my favorite part. At the beginning of the fast, Josh, Maxie, who's been excited about fasting, probably more than most, I uh, was like, are you going to do it, Mark? And Mark's like, I can't do it. I have so much I have to get busy and get done at work. I can't not have energy. And Josh said, well, maybe you could just do it and God would do it for you. <laughs> and then walked off and that's, an that's, that's how subtle the invitations from the Lord can come sometimes it can just be a passing comment from what sounds like, seems like just a friend but in those moments you have to recognize that that could be God yeah. and maybe it'll just work alright, I know we have one more long testimony to share um, is there any more short ones or quick ones, could they be abbreviated come on Trace Wait a man up and, and sign up for the abbreviated yeah. Well, both the marks did it, so I felt confident then. Um, so, like three years ago, um, both my parents passed away, and that was obviously a, a very tough time for me. Um, I struggled a I struggled a long time with it, and 
I'm still struggling with it, you know, in some aspects. But the other day, I just finished doing my fast, and I was coming down the road, and this song came on, Praise You in the Storm by Crest, Casting Crowns. I'm sure someone, someone yeah. here has heard it. And I was driving down the road, and I started to cry. I don't cry a lot. And that song played a lot when I was going through all that. And just I heard it, and I started to cry. And it wasn't like a wasn't a sad thing. I mean, obviously, I was sad that my parents had passed away, but it was a really good thing, because hearing that song, it gave me a lot of hope when um, they had passed away and I was going through that, and just hearing that song, it brought back a whole lot of those memories, and one of those memories was my, uh, when my mother specifically passed away, I got a bill for $100,000 from UVA, and at the time, I was making 15 bucks an hour, like, there was no way I thought for sure I was going to lose my parents' house where I lived and the land and all this stuff. And I just had this in my mind, like, it's kind of it. You know, this is a this is a hard start here. And um, I prayed about it and prayed about it. And it was a, a whole lot of hurdles into getting all of their finances and everything straight. And when I finally got it straightened out, and I was like, all right, tomorrow I'm going to start making the first payment. I logged on and to make the payment and there wasn't, it said zero. I was like, oh great. They put, sent me to collections. Now I really am gonna lose it. And uh, I called them and they were like, oh no, we just, we wrote it off on our taxes. It's all good. And I was like, you know, that was a big thing. And I've, I've thought about sharing that multiple times, but then I got scared. So, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna do it today. But anyway, that was it. <laughs> Anybody else? Fun healings, fun things? Oh, it's Rachel. She made this way worse by making me come up to the front. <laughs> um, I don't know, I was just kind of thinking while we were in worship that there's, there's a lot of issues that I've dealt with like throughout my whole life and I kind of felt like Maybe I had made peace with them in a way, but then I was thinking about um, the Bible story that Matt talked about the other day, and it was like, since I've been coming to this church, I felt like a, a renewed sense of internal struggle, and I was just like, why? Um, and it felt like, you know, God is kind of coming to me and asking, like, can you, can you make me some bread? And I'm kind of the widow that's just like, I only have this much flour and this much oil, I'm going to make my last cake and die. Like, <laughs> uh, I don't have anything to give you. And I don't know, I just felt like during worship, this thought from the Lord came into my mind that like there is kind of like a, a specialness of being in that place where, you know, you don't have anything to give really and you're really struggling uh, and you have nothing left, but God keeps giving you like a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil every day and he's like just you know make me some bread and it's like you just feel like you constantly have nothing left but somehow something keeps showing back up every day and that there's you know being in the struggle is better than than nothing because God is working in your life and if you just had all these problems and felt nothing then it would mean God's not working in your life. <laughs> so it, it's better to be in the struggle than to kind of be nowhere spiritually, to be dead spiritually. Yeah. 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 Amen. I actually used to, um, in, in the Brookfield days, I used to warn people very early on that, uh, that God's going to be real so big in your life, but I want to warn you it might get worse before it gets better. And it often does, because like she, you know, very articulated very well, it's sometimes no storm feels okay, but no storm's not getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Amen, anybody else? No. That's not that's not <laughs> This is three testimonies in one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, this isn't something I was planning on sharing today, but about this time last year, it was a year that Trace and I have been coming to Dayspring, and um, just, I feel like this past year, God has really 
I think for both of us in working on like vulnerability with other people and having like a Christ-centered community because I know Trace didn't really have that and I did when I was younger and then as I grew up like through high school and college and even afterwards like in work these my work environment was very hostile to the gospel and I would have like one person that I knew God had put in my life as like a mentor like in college it was my soccer coach and she was like a very strong Christian and everybody else would just like publicly make fun of Christians and just basically like shame you and so she was kind of my person and then after that I just kind of like built up a shell I guess to protect myself and like because I had seen so many people I was close with walk with the Lord and then hit something hard and just kind of or whoever they surrounded themselves with like they were surrounded by not good people or not good friends and they would just like lead them astray and I was like that's not gonna happen and so I was like I just have to shut out anyone and everything else and like just focus on the Lord and I think it had its purpose but I think it went to an extreme in the sense of like not being able to ask for help or like not I don't know just really distancing yourself from people and it's weird because I always thought like, oh, when I have a Christian community, like, I'll just like be all in. And like this past year, I was like, why do I still feel like I'm struggling? Like, I feel like even you guys have like held at a distance of like, okay, just like out here. And Trace and I have talked about it. I'm like, I don't know why it's so hard. And I think it's just been a habit that's built up and built up and built up. and. So this is kind of like a, a testimony in progress of like, <laughs> not totally down, but like, I feel like the Lord's been like pulling boundaries down and like, I never had like more than like one close friend who was like followed the Lord. And it's just really cool and encouraging to see like a whole community that follows the Lord and like, you can trust. And I think that's the biggest thing is like, knowing that you can trust this community and like you don't have to hold them at an arm's length and so it's just been like a cool journey and i'm excited to see like where it continues to go but Amen. Come on, Joshua. wanted to note that Elizabeth is already awesome and she's telling us there's more awesome we haven't even got to yet. <laughs> God is good. I appreciate everyone sharing because everybody who shared something I've been sitting over there like oh man that's just everything resonating with me that everybody's been sharing. Mic What's that? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I do also hate January. It's been a stressful month, um, difficult month. I've been very grumpy. It's my wife's ex uh, exact words. Um, Love and encouragement. But it's all good because she builds me up and helps me be a better man. So I love her. Um, but two, two praises, really, that I feel like I want to share. One is um, kind of piggybacking off of Bree, what she shared about losing her dad. Um, when we lost, um, I called him Pops. He was my Pops. Um, I called my dad, Dad. I called him Pops. Um, when I lost him, I felt like I lost... Um, a man who was in my corner. He was like in the boxing ring. He he was my whatever that person's called. He was in he was in my corner. And you know, throughout the entire time that I knew him, from the day that I met him, um he believed in me and he cared for me and about everything that I did. 
And when, when we lost him, I felt like alone. And I felt like I had no one in my corner. And it was really short lived. It was like a couple days where I was just in despair. And then all of a sudden, phone calls, men that have been in my life, my whole life, calling me and long phone conversations with my uncles and other pastors and people that have been in my life. And God was just there for me in a huge way. But it didn't stop there. Um, it just continued because I was also feeling alone and just kind of like a in and out the door kind of thing at our prior church. And then when we came here, it was like corner men all over the place coming into my life and um, just so many different people um, that were feeling like, man, these people care about me. You know, it's not like, hey, how you doing? Shake your hand. It's like, hey, shake your hand, look you in the eye. Like, how are you? How are you really doing? Like, let's talk about it. What's what's the Lord doing? Um, that was something I didn't really grow up with a whole lot. Um, we didn't really talk about our feelings and what we're going through and stuff like that. So all of a sudden coming from a place of not having um, or feeling like I had no one, all of a sudden the Lord just blessed me with so many, so many men, so many families, people, friends, um, that I'm just so grateful. And that, that's, that's, I guess, praise number one. Uh, praise number two would be, uh, as I'm going through the beginning of this year, a lot of things are, you know, starting to build up of what the year is going to look like. One is, like I shared the other morning, we're beginning the process of building our home out on our land in Amherst. And, um, you know, that's a big process. And then work stuff is piling up and that's getting stressful. And then um, I kind of let out a little bit too much stress at the gym and I found out that I got a hernia. Um, <laughs> And that was really discouraging because the last two or three years I had had two or three different physical things happen, surgeries that I had to have. And I was just really down and I kind of got real for a minute with the Lord and I talked to Matt about it. I talked to Josh Maxey about it. They were talked to my wife, you know, just where I just the raw, like, you know, I want to believe the Lord can heal me of this. Like, I don't want to go through this and go through surgeries again and rehab and all this, you know, physical rehab and that whole thing that I already went through two or three years ago. Um, I got, you know, I had my appendix removed and I had a shoulder surgery. I tore my shoulder and a couple other little minor things. But, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I was just really kind of real about it, but I, I think I needed to be real about where I was with the Lord and where I stood with him being able to heal me. And last Sunday's um, sermon, which I had talked to Matt that week, and it was almost like it was, you know, one of those sermons like, wow, that was like directed right at me. Not that Matt directed it right at me, but you know what I mean? Um, so. Totally directed it. <laughs> So I was like, you know, still feeling some sort of, um, like I didn't want to get up and come get prayer for, I don't know, it was, it was just, there was some resistance in me. And, you know, Bree was like, all right, let's go up and let's, let's pray for healing. And like, that's, yet again, I just feel like I'm such a blessing to have a wonderful wife who pushes me and, you know, her just saying that was okay. You know, like I didn't have to fight and have to, it was just like, all right, she almost, whatever was wrong inside of me to, you know, I came up and I feel like the prayer was really powerful. And, um, this week I've just been waiting for like that pain and discomfort from it. And some things shifted around and I called Matt and 
we didn't even have we even had a chance to pray about it again but even just talking about it released some things in me and with the lord and praying and like i've had you know i've gone to the gym this week and taking it really light and i haven't had any of that pain and discomfort um this week at all and i i'm, I'm honestly i feel like i'm still in this i'm still in this journey of healing but i know that i can sit here and say that the Lord is beginning to heal me and I'm stepping out in faith in that and um, yeah Amen. my praise Amen. thanks Amen. testimony. I'm telling you what God did for me, he can do for you. And we heard a lot of testimonies here today. So we're all able to plug in somehow, some way. I'm going to begin mine and make it into a little story, but I have to go back to the beginning so you know where I'm at, where I'm going, and where I'm at now. Back in 1985, I came out of the blackest, darkest, coal mine without a light you never can imagine and I got saved in 1985 in the summer I don't I don't know the day but it was Sunday night 1986 God in, in this all this he's he showing me blues and creams and and, and it's just oh I love it I'm on my motorcycle and I'm riding and I'm just going down 23 and it's along the shoreline of Lake Huron and, and, the, and the blues and the greens. It's alive. I'm alive. I'm coming down and there's a city and I was going to go over and, and make a big loop around. And it turns into a four lane and I'm coming into the city about eight miles, nine miles out. And as I'm coming in, I'm, I'm on the inside lane and the car is on my right. I'm looking on the other lane, and two cars are coming out of town. They're they're putting a hammer to the you know, putting a hammer down, and they're getting speed up. What I didn't know was this car on my right was going to turn, make a right hand turn into this little shopping center. What I didn't know was there was a guy coming out of the shopping center. He saw her blinker. And he's going to put his nose up to the line, wait for these guys to come by, and then he's going to come out and make a left. He didn't see me. I went on a bike. So he pulls out. She's getting ready to pull in, and I just T-bone him 50 miles an hour. I messed my bike up. But I hit him, and I hit him head on, I, I, right head on, and there's a big old Ford. I spun around and a woman behind me said, you spun around, you went underneath the car, it scared the guy, he didn't see it, I mean, he didn't know what happened until after. But he get the gas and then he ran over me. And I'm laying there, and we go off. And I got legs taken care of, arms and everything. When I get to a point I can walk again with a cast on and all that, I go back to church. When I got saved, I, I saw so many miracles happen on that one day. Oh, I, I was delivered from alcoholism, drugs, three to a half packs of cigarettes minimum per day. Suicide. I, 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 I was full-blown PTSD. Suicidal thoughts constantly. I, I'm always thinking about how I can... Nightmares. Foulest, foulest, foulest mouth you ever seen. You didn't want to see. He delivered me from that all in one day. So I know God does miracles, signs, and wonders. And I'm in a church that practices signs, wonders, and miracles. So I go back to church and I hobble in and, and, and I go up and I, I need prayer. My back, my neck, headache. I'm already taking medication for, for pain. I had him head on 50 miles an hour. Boy, I did some damage. 1986. 
I'm going out for prayer every time, every time, every time. Lord, heal me, help me, heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. I believe, I believe. I had more than a mustard seed of faith. I went everywhere. Pastor, he retired. I moved to, we, we went to another church, and, and it was more, more filled with, a, with the Spirit of God. And, and this was in a time when Brownsville, if you heard of Brownsville Revival, Brown, this was a time, and we were getting touched by it. We were, we were just anointed with the two like that. Signs of my leg came out shaken. It was an inch shorter. It came out. It, it, it came perfect. I, I saw it all. I seen people all around me getting healed. But I didn't. I didn't. I'm desperate. I'm hurting. I'm, pay, I'm taking pills by the handful. And it's a cocktail pills. I'm hurting. I'm starting to chase. I said, come on, we're going down to Florida. We're going down to Brownsville. To the revival. Great things are happening. I go down there and, and, and it's just anointed. And I drive back to Michigan from Florida. My back's killing me. My neck's killing me. My head is splitting. It's like driving a nail in there. Why? Why do I see everybody heal? All around me. I never do. I go to Toronto. I go there with a the bro. I, before I go, I, I go to the dentist. I, I, I was eating popcorn. I had a kernel and I, and I broke a big one. I think there's three roots in there. They all broke. He's going to pull it. I said, no, no, I'm going to Toronto. I go to Toronto. I come back. He takes the x-ray. It's healed. But I come back, my back, my neck, my head. I stop in Canada. I, I get more pills. They didn't even buy them better there. I'm Jason. And I'm wondering, why do you get healed? Why do you get healed? Why do you get healed? But I don't get healed. 1986. And time's rolling on. But I never give up. Hope. Hope. Yeah. I'm always hoping. I'm always asking. I'm pleading with the Lord, please help me. I wake up in the morning and I start popping them. I'm popping them all day long, three, four at a time. You know, I'm supposed to take one, I guess. It just brings it down. You can get the scourging. Time, 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 again. Year after year, you don't get healed. Why, Lord, why, Lord, why? Am I that bad? Was I that bad? You start questioning, you start answering, and, and, and wondering why. But I'm chasing. I'm retired, I moved down here, and we're going to Tree of Life. I'm in a four year. And I see this couple coming down the, up, the, you know, up the walkway. And I didn't see them before. I met a couple and, and these three young ladies. And I go over and I shake hands and introduce myself and welcome them. And then I watch them. They're sitting down here and I'm sitting up here. And, well, they're praising the Lord. I said, well, they're not heathens. They're, they're believers. It was my birthday. And on the way out, we actually said, hi, how are you doing? And Gaddy says, it's your birthday today. She says, I'm going to take you out for dinner. I said, okay. So she took me out for dinner. We're, we're sitting in the back of the restaurant. And after we get done eating, we're coming out, and, and there's that couple. And we got talking, and their daughter is going to LU, and they're up here from North Carolina. 
visiting and, and we just get talking and she says have you heard about the, the revival in North Carolina or North Georgia North Georgia revival and I we said no oh yeah he says, this Baptist pastor came alive in, in the Pentecostal church he's walking back and forth and he's just on fire speaking in tongues an old Baptist he said there's a baptismal pool there and it's empty and God gives him a vision and it's full of water three to four foot wide fire from one end to the other and he says Todd that's the pastor's name he says Todd I'm going to baptize people in the, in the fire I'm going to meet them in the water I said Kathy we got to go but come to find out he was going to be in North Carolina at a church on, on the west side northwest side there three and a half hours away I said let's go so we went there I thought this is it always have hope never give up so we go there I came back with bad back bad neck but what I did get there was back in Toronto I got filled with the Holy Spirit to speak in tongues and I spoke in tongues but then when I went to bed I woke up the next morning it was gone but from that day on I received it in North Carolina and I said devil you stole it once I'm not gonna let you steal it again and I've been speaking in tongues three and a half hours back I just prayed in tongues and I, I pray in tongues I, I, you're gonna pay for this but he says there's a guy coming and going to be a guest speaker in North Carolina or North, or North Georgia. His name is David Hogan. Didn't know who he was, but we're looking it up. This guy raises up. He doesn't, but Jesus raises people up from the dead. Seven or nine people so far he's raised alone. And then in his ministry, these guys, he's, he's ministering to them. They're going out in, now into North and uh, into Mexico, Central America, South America. They've got 170 some people that have raised from the dead. Signs and wonders. I said, let's go. So we go down to North Georgia Revival. And there's that baptismal. He said, I'm going to go in the water. But that night, Hogan, after he gets done, he says, I'm going to pray for people. And he's coming down the line and he's just, as he's walking, he's just laying hands on people. But he comes up to me and he grabs me like this, both arms eye to eye and he just ministers into me ministers into me for that remember with the with the uh, speaking in tongues praying he said hey before you come to church tonight he said if you want he said you can you can come and pray and uh, we went there and we we're praying and I prayed for an hour and something before church and then when it first started he said Go ahead and, and get up and, and greet around you so i'm getting up and i'm greeting people in front of me i'm greeting them over here i'm the fifth one in fifth seat me my wife empty seat man's wife a man i turn around and i'm greeting the people and i, I come to this guy kathy's out and walking about doing her thing and he looks at me and he looks down he looks at me and he grins and he smiles and he looks down and he looks back up at me and he says, you see that? And I said, what? He said, look at your seat. My complete seat and the seat on my right and on the seat on my left, this much, half, less than half, but this much, covered in gold, gold dust, gold flakes. You couldn't pick them up. They were that fine. The anointing was there. Hogan's praying for me like this. His son later on prays for me and he's scooping up and, and scooping up. He's praying over me. I leave Georgia with a sore back, a sore neck, and a head that's killing me. All of that. And I didn't get healed. But before this, this is where you, some of you heard it, God was dealing with me about unforgiveness. And I was going through this unforgiveness and I, I, I forgave everybody. I forgave everybody. I forgave everybody I could possibly think of. But here was that devil up here whispering in my ear, but how could they? 
How could they do what they did to you? You didn't deserve it. How could they? You're a good boy. They're a bad person. How could they? And then I'm like a fool, I chime in. Yeah. Yeah. How could they do that? I didn't deserve it. And I, it just never goes away. It just. And when we left there, he said, I'm going to have a woman here. And she's going to give a testimony. It's, it's awesome. We came home and it was that, like three weeks later she was going to be there. And I said, Kathy, I said, I got to go. I got to go back there for some reason. God's calling me back. I got to go. She said, I got to work. I said, I got to go. She said, go. So I went back down there and she had this awesome testimony of what happened to her. She was raped by her uncle, molested by her dad, blah, 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 drug cartels down in, in Columbia. She was mistress blah 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 and a harem and all this and, and it's terrible she ended up meeting the lord in prison and, she, and he told her you're going to go out into the ministry and, I, and you're going to spread the word i'm going to use you in a mighty way you're going to write books blah 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 but she had the same thing happen to her and she said bless him forgive him one more time and bless him and she blessed him he came back and she just blessed him she came back and blessed him. Got to the point he finally quit. I did that all the way back from Georgia back. I, I blessed everybody. I blessed them. I thought I had all my bases covered. I thought I forgot everybody. Everybody. I'm good to go. Start hearing about this other Baptist pastor that became Pentecostal, that became a radical for Jesus in Tennessee. And we're watching him. And he's into deliverance ministry now, mass deliverance ministry. And I'm starting to wonder, Lord, I had a shady past. I had a, I had a, a bad, before I got saved, uh, uh, did I open the doors? And let a demon in. Do I have a demon in me that is a tormenting spirit? Is that why I am in such pain and I cannot get healed? I have a demon in me. So we're going. I said, we got to go. We, we go there. And he has a mass thing. And, and people are, are coming all over the place and they're manifesting. And uh, guys are coming in. People are coming in and ministering. I didn't feel anything. A lot of people around me didn't. So I don't know if things came out or not. But he said, my wife is anointed to pray for healing. So if you want healing, come forward. Of course I went forward. I never gave up hope. So I go forward. But before that, he said, now I want to tell you, unforgiveness will stop a healing. He said, if you have unforgiveness in you, it will stop the healing. I went forward because I was, I was good. I forgave everybody. I came back from Tennessee. Bad back, bad neck, headache, dying. It was about this time I'm starting to I mean, really fall apart. I'm starting to walk short distances and I can't do it. I'm, I'm exhausted. My legs are giving out. When I stand for more than five minutes, my legs go numb, my butt goes numb down to my knees. Now it's progressed to where if I stand a little bit longer and try to hold on, my feet are now going numb. But now I can't even walk and I'm exhausted and I, I, my, my legs and everything are given up and I said no Lord please no no please don't take this give me more pain I'll take it increase the pain in my back increase the pain in my neck increase this pain in my head but please please don't take that I got a yard I got to ride a more, but I hate it I like my push lawn more. It takes me four, four and a half hours to cut it. But I love it. Please. Oh, please. No. 
come back and it's that happened and, and right after Thanksgiving. And I came back from Tennessee and that's when I the next two we come back Monday and Tuesday. Kathy went to work and I went to the bathroom again and that's when God said put it in my heart to pee on the strip. Because I had to go. I peed on the strip and I was negative. I, I got healed. For goat in Tennessee. Not my back. Not my neck. I'm dying. My head's splitting. But I went from there and I grabbed my coffee and I went and sat in my chair where I read my Bible. And I started reading my Bible. I usually read from quarter to eight, nine, ten, ten thirty. I'm reading my Bible and I don't know how long. It wasn't that long. Back in the 70s, a cousin of mine came to my mind in an incident. He came back from now and I came back. Not good. PTSD, both of us fools. Something happened and I never spoke to him since then. I never wanted to look at him. If we were walking, I'd, I'd turn my head. I wouldn't give him the time of day. But I forgot about it. I pushed it down with everything else. I, I'm good at that. I'm, I'm good at that. I, I push it down. I forget about it. It hurts. I push all these hurts down. I said, oh Lord. I forgot about him. I forgave him. I started blessing him. Not much, just blessing him. I go back to reading. He brings this person from the past. All of us. I forgive him. Bless him. And this just went on. I didn't get done reading until after 1.30. He brought somebody back. And I hadn't forgot, forgiven. But I thought I did. He brought him back. And I forgave him. And I just kept reading after a while. Just to make sure. I got him. And I felt good that this was it. New Year's was coming on Sunday. On the Wednesday before, my right foot is flaring up my toe. I, I can't sleep now. Sheet on it, on the bed. It's just unbearable. I can't walk on it hardly. Lord, what's going on? You healed me. So I go back in the bathroom, I pee on the strip. I'm good. I'm negative. Came to church Sunday and I said we're gonna we're gonna fast and pray and I said good. Began fasting and praying. The pain in my foot's increasing. Yeah, what's more pain? Eh? The following Sunday we're, I'm going to uh, we do here there here there. The following Sunday, I go to King Street, and we get done, pastor gets done ministering, and he says, I feel the anointing power of the Holy Spirit for healing today. Anybody need healing, come forward. So everybody's going forward for healing. I'm sitting in the back because I can't stand. Five minutes, my legs give out. They go numb, and I'm afraid I'm going to fall and hurt myself. So I wait for everybody to clear out, then out. And then I go forward and, and I come up and, and David says, how you doing, Al? And I says, no good, no good. I said, I'm dying, man. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm dying. Puts his hand on my back and prays for me. Somebody was over here, I guess, and, and he gets done praying and he looks over here and, and he's Dylan, this guy, this young man, Dylan, he's over here and he grabs a hold of him and he, he brings him over and he says, pray for him. If I didn't know Dylan, I, I would think he's a doctor. I mean, he's going through me like, Lord, 
this thing between the disc and this thing and the bulging and the, he's talking like a doctor, but he's, he's not. He's praying for all this. He's checking my foot, my legs and uh, for length and I'm uh, good. And he gets all done. And then he's just standing there and looking and I, I know something's going on. My back still hurt, my neck still hurt. I didn't tell him about the pain in my foot. And he said, God's telling me that he's healing you right now of diabetes. Well, I don't have diabetes, but I didn't say anything. So he prays. When he gets done, I said, Dylan, I says, I think you missed it, but I don't have diabetes. He said, well, God told me to pray for you for healing because you got diabetes. And we're just talking just for a little bit, and all of a sudden, the light comes on. I said, Dylan, wait a minute. My foot is killing me. It's got all these like needles in there, and I, I can't touch it. I can't walk on it. He said, and he said a word that long. He said, you got that. I said, what's that? He says, diabetes. I, I went up for healing. Like in Tennessee, I went up for healing. I got healed to go. I go for healing here for my back and neck and, and headache. I get healed of diabetes that I actually didn't know I had. I knew the symptoms. Whoa. Oh, on Sunday, last Sunday, we're here. Pastor Matt gets done ministering. And he said, anybody need to come up for prayer. He didn't say healing. He just said, anybody who needs to come up for prayer for, for anything, come on up. We're up here. So a couple came up and, and they started praying with him. I sat back there and I, I just sat. I can knock on stand. I can't. I'm falling apart. Slowly falling apart. And then somebody else came. So I said, oh, the seat's empty up here. So I came up and I sat down and, and there you are. And Ben was standing there. And I said, you're here for prayer too? He said, yeah. So Ben comes up and he gets prayed for. Snot running down his nose, tears down his eyes. <laughs> God's just doing a, an awesome work. And, and man, and I'm, this is so encouraging when you're down and out, even to see people around you getting healed and getting getting help even if you don't get touched it's, it, it's still a good thing it's always a good thing so Ben was an encouragement to me they got done with Ben and, and they said come on so I stood up he said what's wrong I said my neck my back my headache he prayed for me Pearson was on this side. Tim was on this side. Pastor Matt was in the front. And they're praying for me, for my back, my neck, my headache. They get done praying. And Kirsten starts praying in tongues, slowly, softly. And then there's a moment of silence. And she says, God's healing your stomach, your heart, and your blood. You see the pattern? Come up for back, neck, head, headache, and he fixes something else. I know I had blood work done and leaky gut, but there's other things and, she, and, and playing all this, she's got me on all this stuff to build my guts back up, so there's my gut. High blood pressure, and I don't know what all. He's got belts and everything else in there. The heart and my blood. Lionel Hall, she takes my blood and she says, See all the little things there? Yeah, I says, Yeah. She says, Those are what carry oxygen and, and nutrients and vitamins and minerals and feeds your body all this. But you see all them? You've got them all clumped together. So many clumps in that little bitty drop. So many clumps in there. She says, Oh, she said, That's not good. That's not good. <laughs> So she puts me on, on stuff to do that because I'm not getting the oxygen and the, and the nutrients to my body. 
There's the blood. I sit down, because I can't stand. Kirsten comes up, and I'm praying behind him there in, in the spirit. You go and eat, and to, I'll just shorten this up real quick. I don't know where we're at on time. We go out, and I get to go on uh, Rivermont, and I take a right, and I'm going to go home that way. And Kathy says, oh, she says, I want to go the other way. Do you mind? <laughs> and I says, no. That's all right. So I whipped around. And we go up, and we end up going up 501, and instead of coming back around Madison Heights and all that, I said, let's go over the mountain. I haven't been over the mountain in a couple of years. We'll go down to Buchanan, and then come back 43. We come into Buchanan, before we get there, Kathy says, oh, she said, they got flooded. I know. So we go in, and I'm, I'm going to go through town and just turn around and come back, and then get on 43. And, Kathy said, oh, I got to go to the bathroom. I said, well, the only gas station is back here. We're going to turn around and come back anyway. So I'm turning around and, and coming back. And I said, oh, look. I said, an uh, antique shop. And they're open. Now there's a park. There's a car, 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 parking spot. Car, 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 parking spot. Car, car. I don't do them. I haven't done them since 1986. <laughs> You got to turn your neck to do that. I got to turn my body, and I don't do that. If I do, I'm going to pay for it for days or a week. I don't do that. On the other side, there's four spots. So we pull in, I turn around, she goes to the bathroom, we come back, turn back around, and get in the parking spot, we go in the store. We spent I don't know how much time in that antique store. My legs never hurt. Jesus. <laughs> we get out in the car and we're standing there talking to these people for the longest time about the cannon, about up in the mountain, the coal mine being shut down, and poverty, this and that, and this and that. And we're standing there like they're the old, old friends that we've met and known forever. We're just talking and talking, and I'm standing and I'm standing and I'm standing. And my legs don't hurt, go numb. Jesus. <laughs> We get out in the car, and I get in, and she goes around her side, puts her stuff in, and she gets in, and I says, do you know what happened? She says, what? I said, I'm standing all that time, and my legs don't hurt. Jesus. My legs don't go numb. Jesus. But I said, better than that. My back don't hurt. <laughs> my neck don't hurt, and I don't have a headache. What was the key? What was the key? When did that start? Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. If you don't forgive those, matter of fact, let me read it real quick. Matthew, Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, nurturing your hurt and anger with the result that it interferes with your relationship with God, then your Father will not forgive you your trespasses. Forgiveness. Friday, I sit down with my coffee, I open my Bible, and I just start reading. Got nothing to do with it, it's, it's in Ezekiel. But I got to thinking real quick there, it's like, what happens? You're born again, and you assume when you ask God to forgive you, you're forgiven. But if you have unforgiveness in your heart towards others, His Word just said right there, He will not forgive you. 
I know when you go to heaven, there's crowns and there's beautiful robes and all this that, that, that we hear about. But with all that unforgiveness and not being forgiven, he doesn't forgive you your sin because you didn't forgive them that sinned against you. What does that do to us? That made me think. Am I going to walk around heaven forever with just a pure white gown and the thinnest little crown? Did I rob myself of that because I was unwilling to forgive those that sinned against me? There's a lot to that. He wouldn't heal me. He wouldn't heal me because of unforgiveness. But once I forgave, he healed me. Please don't let that stop you from your reward in heaven. And I don't know what happens. Past Matt maybe has an explanation, but I'm, I just ask God, forgive me for all those sins that I asked forgiveness for, but you could not forgive me because I did not forgive. Forgive me, Father. Have mercy. I don't know. Do they go away when you forgive that last person and all those, I don't know. But I didn't want to take a chance and I, I don't have the answer. Please, don't carry unforgiveness. There's so much there. 36 years from 1986 to 19 or 20, might as well say because it was in summertime. 36 years I held on forgiveness but I stopped I'm the one that got to go out and open the gate he's standing at the gate he's not going to come in and heal me and I don't know what else he does finances whatever but I had to go open that gate after unforgiveness was taken care of and then he walks in and heals me amen Thank you. <laughs> Amen. God is good. Life is hard and complicated sometimes, but no need to drag that on any further than it has to be. Get honest and real with God like the man last week. God, I believe you and you help me in my unbelief. Amen. There's more. We're way, way past time for the kids to be in the back. Um, so we'll do more testimonies next week if you got more. Love everybody. Let's grab some lunch. Let's get the kids. Love you guys.